Welcome back to our series on introductory statistics. I'm Mark Ledbetter and this is lecture video number three. We're going to start chapter two and before we do that let's review some things from chapter one. Let me zoom in so we can see these a little better. We have talked about the study of statistics and I've told you that the exciting thing for me about statistics is that we can analyze a very small sample relative to the population and no matter what it is that we're trying to answer, we can use statistics to find uh, all of this information out and discover all this information about the population without having to know the underlying uh, formula or laws that may not uh, exist at this time. In other words, no one may have discovered them. They may be too complex or complicated to, to uh, figure out uh, too many variations in statistics will help us learn what we need to learn there. Then we talked about the types of studies. There are two types of studies, observational studies and designs of experiments. Observational studies are exactly what they sound like. We observe the process that's occurring without any interference. Design of experiments, we set up the experiment to change the inputs in order to be able to uh, look at the results and say and determine statistically whether or not there is a cause and effect relationship there. So again, in this course, we're only looking at observational studies. So some vocabulary for uh, data are individuals. Those are the, the members of that are contained in our population of interest. Okay. A variable is a quantity that changes, say, from person to person, or could change. And these are the things that we want to measure, like height, weight, uh, temperature, etc. We're going to deal with two types of random samples. One is simply the random sample method, and that is where each of the individuals have the same chance of being selected. A simple random sample is one in which any group of n individuals of the same size, same quantity, have exactly the same chance or probability of being selected. Then we went to parameters versus statistics. And as I mentioned, this is an area that stumps some students, especially later in the course, because we mention it now, then we may not uh, do this comparison for a while, and then it becomes very important that we can tell the difference. So parameters and statistics deal with the same quantities. So here we have a mean, and if we're talking about the population mean, population starts with P, parameter starts with P. If we're talking about the population, then it's a parameter. If we're talking about the mean of a sample, then it's a statistic. S and S, P and P go together. And for a while, we'll be talking about a lot of sample statistics and the calculations. And then we'll get to inference where we still calculate the sample quantity, but in order to learn something about the parameter quantity that we don't know. All right. So hopefully we can uh, keep those straight this semester and avoid the confusion. Then we talked about the two types of data. There's qualitative data and there's quantitative data. Qualitative data is simply data that can be put into categories. And remember, we can use letters or numbers, so words or numbers, but here the numbers aren't, um, they don't act like numbers. In other words, you can't add or subtract them. They are simply a label. Telephone numbers, zip codes, those are some good examples. Even the numbers on the back of uh, sports jerseys in the front and back, uh, number seven. That just identifies that person. And then there's quantitative data. That's where the numbers behave like numbers. We can add, subtract, uh, multiply, etc. There are two types of quantitative data. There's discrete and there are continuous. Discrete have gaps between the values. I believe I used the example of a hen laying eggs. The hen can lay no eggs that week or it can lay one egg that week, and there's a gap between zero and one. It can't lay part of an egg, and so forth. Whereas most quantities are continuous um, that we encounter. Time is continuous. We only measure anything in discrete units, 
because we have to stop at some decimal point. Um, but that doesn't make the underlying quantity not continuous. So time is continuous. Distances are continuous. Anything calculated on distance, like area or volume, will be continuous. Pressure is continuous. Heat or temperature, continuous. Many quantities are continuous. Few, fewer are discrete. Okay, but that's not an absolute rule, all right? So it's just what we encounter, uh, most of what I encounter is continuous. All right. Now, levels of measurement. We've listed them from lowest to highest. Lowest being nominal. Only thing you can do uh, to measure categorical data, purely categorical data, is to put it into categories and then count. So that categorization of the uh, data into categories is the measurement um, level called nominal. That's the nominal measurement is categorizing. The next higher level is ordinal. Not only can we put it into a category, but we can put them into order. Okay, And so in a race, we might know that uh, the first place was uh, Tom Jones. The second place was uh, 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 Jim Marshall or something. And we've got first and second. We don't know how close they were or how far apart they were. And then we've got uh, interval data. So it's the next to most uh, highest level of measurement. With an interval, we can take the difference between two values and it makes sense. But we cannot take a ratio because interval data doesn't have a natural zero, a natural starting point. So it doesn't make any sense to take the ratio of two uh, temperatures in Fahrenheit because Zero Fahrenheit is not absolute zero um, absence of temperature or heat. Okay? And same thing with survey data. Most of the survey questions are asked in such a way that zero is not an answer. The absence of what's being measured. Okay. Ratio data, a lot of data is ratio data because it does have a natural zero. So uh, time, if we're starting time, like if we're timing an event, zero is, is the absence of the event. It hasn't started yet, okay? Uh, and then the time is continuous. It goes up to the end of the event or to the end of this person racing, etc. cetera. Uh, but if we talk about time as in years on the calendar date, then it's, um, it's not only continuous, it's not ratio anymore. Okay, it's continuous, but it's not ratio anymore because zero AD is not the beginning of time or the absence of time. Okay, we don't know when that is. So it doesn't make sense to say that's twice as far along in history as this other thing. So the ratio doesn't make sense if we're talking about the year uh, as the calendar years as they're annotated now. Okay, so that was chapter one, and that's a good basis. Let's look at chapter two. It's called Organizing Data. This is a, one of the parts of the boring definition of statistics. It's important. Um, so we need to organize data. Today we're going to look at frequency tables. Unfortunately, with all this preparatory information here in the review, we don't have time to get very far. Uh, but I think review is very important, and uh, I don't want to include too much in one video. So we'll start talking about frequency tables and finish it up in the next lecture. So this chapter has histograms, distribution shapes, cumulative uh, frequency tables and ogives, bar graphs, circle graphs or pie charts, time series, and stem and leaf displays. So what are our goals or objectives for this chapter? We want to be able to, at the end of this chapter, summarize data into a frequency table, a relative frequency table, or a cumulative type table. There's a couple. We want to be able to construct histograms and line charts, and we want to be able to determine the general shape of data and interpret these histograms and line charts. A simple interpretation. So why, though? Why is it that we want to summarize or organize data? Well, I've found through many years of experience that no matter who it is, um, except maybe one or two super geniuses in the world, no one can look at a, a large data set 
and in their mind summarize it and understand the shape of the data, the spread of the data, uh, and what is going on in that data. We need to summarize it. Our minds work better with summaries. So also, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's probably worth more than that in this case. So I think that's a low uh, estimate of how, how much a picture is worth. Now, why do we want to do this though? Besides not being able to uh, do this in our head, why do we want to organize or summarize this data in the first place? Well, almost everything, almost every test that we use in statistics is based on some assumption. Even, so I've put parametric and non-parametric here. Parametric means that we are uh, talking about a specific distribution, like the normal distribution, binomial distribution, uh, or something along those lines. There's many of them. Non-parametric means that we're not really making an assumption about which distribution it is. But even those non-parametric tests, almost all of them are based on some type of assumption. And if that assumption is not met, then the analysis will be meaningless. And nobody wants to waste their time with meaningless analysis. And again, we'll see this in chapter four. Uh, that's the soonest we'll see this. So um, again, if we have a picture, sometimes we can easily see if our assumptions are greatly or obviously violated. Okay. So that's a why. So now let's take a look at a frequency table. So here we have all of these different uh, elements of the frequency table. We have the class limits. You'll notice there's a lower and an upper. Class boundaries, a tally, frequency, and a midpoint. So here the data is divided into equal, non-overlapping intervals. Notice that 1 to 8 is an interval from 1 to 8. And we call these intervals here classes. So these are, these are the different classes. And here there's six different classes in this table. Each class has an upper and a lower class limit. They also have an upper and lower class boundary. And try not to get these confused. Next time we'll actually uh, make this uh, frequency table and hopefully you'll see the difference. So we're going to count how many values fall into each of these classes. You see here for the first one, there were 14. And that number is going to summarize our data. And the class midpoint is the average of the class limits or the boundaries. If I add up 0.5 and 8.5, I get 9 divided by 2. There's two of those values. It's 4.5. If I add up 1 and 8, I get 9 divided by 2. It's 4.5. So that's what information is in there. So the book gives a nice definition of a frequency table. It says it partitions uh, data into our classes or intervals and tells us how many values are in each of those classes. And these classes do not overlap and they don't have a gap between them where data could fall into those in between the classes. So the data has to be, each value has to be in exactly one class, not more, not less. Because when we finish, we want to add up this total frequency, and that should be n, which is our sample size, how many we have in the sample. Okay? So that is what a frequency table is and what it looks like. Next time, we'll actually construct that frequency a table from the data. So please don't forget to scan in your lecture notes by midnight uh, on the date on which this video is due. And make sure that it's neat. Again, this is not for me. I do look at them, but I don't have to go back and refer to them. And so the neatness is for you. And I hope you did uh, start your formula sheet for this. If you didn't, you might want to back up and write down the formulas. Remember, your formula sheet can have formulas on it but nothing else, no examples or anything like that. If you have questions, please come to my virtual office hours. If for some reason you can't make it to them or you have a deadline or something and you need to, to talk to me first uh, or before then, 
email me. I'm happy to help you, happy to meet outside of those uh, times. Uh, so I hope to see you next time. Until then, think statistics.